Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Fergal. I am the uh, facilitator for the uh, Virtual Job Club. And today I am uh, grateful to have Kathleen Gallagher and Angela Smith here today to talk about you know, how to effectively network in the time of uh, COVID. Uh, which is a challenging time as it is. I'm going to just go over some brief information about WorkNet DuPage, and then uh, we'll go into uh, the presentation. So, uh, I am, again, I'm Jim Fergal. I'm the manager of Job Seeker and Veteran Services. Amy Ulo is the manager of Marketing Communication. She Morning. will be on here. Okay. Uh, Javon Morris is a workshop facilitator. Good morning. And Jennifer Wegeman is a workshop facilitator. Good morning, everyone. So you may see answers in the Q&A from any one of the four of us. So uh, just so you know that this is who, who we are. And we do this uh, every Friday at nine o'clock in the morning until I guess this COVID is over. So I, I'm assuming for a while here. So Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, WIOA, that's the grant under which we are uh, funded. Uh, the Virtual Job Club is open to the public. Uh, you, there is an application, uh, actually a questionnaire, possibly an application because we are changing things, our bud budget year is starting again. Uh, so go to our website, worknetdupage.org and hit the get started button. Uh, you do have to qualify for our job search workshops uh, and training grants up to $10,000. Uh, we will fund training for uh, everything from Agile Scrum, PMP, uh, medical assistant, CDLA, uh, are just some of the uh, occupations that we will fund certification training for. Uh, every Tuesday, we do have a layoff to launch workshop. And again, uh, please go to worknetdupage.org. So the layoff, to, uh, layoff from layoff to launch workshop, uh, we'll explain how you uh, can qualify for the grant, the WIOA grant. Uh, to upgrade your skills. You can also continue to receive unemployment while you are in a training program. They will go over that. And there's no need to pay back uh, the $10,000 if you get that, or $5,000 depending on the training. Uh, the only thing uh, the program asks, and I'll repeat this again at the end, is that our return on investment is how many people get jobs. And so we would appreciate, well actually, uh, we have to report back to Congress that information. So when you're, when you're working with a counselor, and Jennifer and Javon would be counselors for the job search workshops, uh, you would let them know that you got a job, uh, the company, the position, the salary, and what benefits. Uh, because that's the only way Congress is going to know if these programs work. And uh, if there's a negative, uh, then they stop funding. So just to give you an idea, we have a 70% uh, requirement. That's one of 24, I believe, that we have to meet. Uh, and if we miss one, we uh, are on probation. Miss two of the 24, we lose the grant. So as some of you know, I've been here 25 years uh, through different things, promotions and things. And every year I've been here, we've always made 70%. Additionally, I can say with pride, is every year I've been here, we have made 80% uh, placement. And what that means is uh, when we are able to account for 80% of the people getting jobs, is we can serve more public, we get, we get incentive monies. So that's why it's so important for you to let us know when you get a position. We are not going to find jobs for you, although we have a business team out there developing relationships with employers. We are teaching you how to fish, how to find those positions. So please let us know so we can get this uh, program uh, continuing in the future for other people. 
we are here today because of people in the past. You are able to take advantage of this from people in the past who have let us know uh, that we got the positions. Okay, uh, so at this time, I would like to uh, introduce Kathleen Gallagher and Angela Smith, who will uh, be talking about how to effectively network in the time of COVID. Uh, and we will go there. So I am going to turn off my video. And go ahead. Okay, well, thank you so much for the uh, information. My name is Kathleen Gallagher. I'm one of the presenters today, and I have to start by saying what our goal is. And we know it's tough out there. We know it's a, a lot of things going on, trying to juggle kids at home and school and trying to find a job. But our goal is to give you some tips and tricks that might help you uh, get a job more quickly and, and get something that you'd like. Uh, additionally, we just we added a bit of humor to our presentation because we Absolutely. figured there's enough solemnity out there and enough enough things that are you know bound to keep you um, engaged that we thought some humor might help. Uh, you'll hear the best and the worst of our careers. <laughs> Angela and I are both entrepreneurs and have worked in the, com the corporate world as well. Uh, the thing that I wanted to add, I've sat in on so many of these different presentations, and I've sat in the back of the room and thought. These people have no idea. They must have it made. They're, they're not experiencing the same thing I am. And the truth is, you know, I'm, I'm okay. We're talking about it now. I was downsized. I was right sized. I was promoted. I, was, I mean, it was crazy. And I was in publishing and advertising. And I just want you to know, I feel your pain. I just remember the first time I got downsized. I've been downsized several times, just crying and driving home in my little pants seat on 355 and thinking, how could this happen to me? And I'm sure a lot of you have endured and been through some of the similar experiences, but that will pass and hopefully we'll give you some tips and tricks today that'll make it easier for you to move into the world of networking and ideally find a, find a job. So with that, I'm turning it over to my colleague. My background is, um, is different than, than Kathleen's. Uh, Purdue graduate, I ended up graduating in uh, public relations and business organizational communications. I particularly like the business organizational communications, which really fed into some good background um, as I've been with a Fortune 50 company, Eastman Kodak for many years. Then I was with a smaller subchapter S $26 million company um, in consultative sales, director of sales, where had uh, territories across the nation and other salespeople who would re report to me. And then more recently, my own company, and that company is Niche Events. And right now, as, as you can all imagine, it's um, you know, very, very challenging in this surreal environment that we've, we've come upon. Um, other, other things in my background, which are very, very helpful in networking that would be helpful to you as well. I was active within um, a school type things. I was president of a PTC. I was a VP of a, a boosters board at the high school level, District uh, 87 within uh, Glenbard District. Um, active in the church. I was also employed at the Art Institute as, as far as running their, their member lounge and coordinating with different departments within the Art Institute, being a central marketing center for the heads of the different areas to supply information. And I'm still active within the Art Institute as, as a volunteer. Great. So the first question we have to examine is why are we here? What, what do we have to gain? And the truth is networking is part of our society and we probably have done it casually for years and never really gave it much thought, but it's even more important now that you're in the job hunting role. Um, you know, I, I've used networking a lot professionally, but also as a parent and having two kids and working full time, it's been very helpful in terms of scheduling, you know, rides home with people. I mean, you network all the time and you don't realize how significant it is to help you with your, your family and some of the things that you're um, engaged in. But we realize that not everybody's an extrovert like Angela and I, and, and, and it doesn't come easy to everybody. So we'll, we'll be going over some, some things to help you um, get get used to it. 
And I tell you, it's the easiest way to get a job. I think Jim's research indicates that 80% of people that get jobs have used networking to, um, to advance their, their search. Networking, what's, what's in it for, for all of us? It's always good to broaden your horizon. Uh, always good to know and be aware of others' points of view, no matter what the topic are. So it can be even alumni organizations, uh, trade shows, which many of us uh, have had the experience of presenting, frequenting. They can encompass several different vertical markets, but require similar skill sets that could offer a greater range of job opportunities to all of you. One thing that I was involved in was a direct marketing organization of Wisconsin. And I believe I was the first person on the board from Illinois. And just to give you an example of how networking can happen, by being on that board and networking at different events, I was able to meet uh, management within Northwestern Mutual Life, Miller Brewing. Northwestern Mutual Life was a company that Johnson and Quinn, who I was with at the time, had tried for years to break into. And just because I got to know so many on the management team, I was able to break into um, that account and they still have my company, Johnson and Quinn, they still are running a fulfillment job uh, daily. So great revenue for the company to this, this day. And we're also gonna mention different things as, as far as just things to talk about. Golf, sports, of course, we're a little sports deprived at this time. And again, volunteering and we're going to get into more detail in each of these in terms of volunteering you'll hear both angela and i speak about it uh, quite a bit and i'll be honest with you when i was 30 and single i couldn't imagine going to work and not getting paid for it but the older i've, I've gotten i've realized what the um the takeaways are from volunteer work and there's so many options the one that has been most um prominent for me and my children lately has been the food pantries it's several food pantries mm -hmm. and that's um a very viable thing these days. But some of the other things I've done, I, I volunteered for a chamber uh, event in uh, Glen Ellen. I thought, oh, this is gonna be a drag. I don't know anybody. Well, I got down there, they put me in a beer tent and I was, <laughs> I was doing, I was doing uh, ID checks. I felt like a bouncer at a tavern or something. <laughs> but I, I met the nicest people. One of the first gentlemen I met was uh, somebody else that was looking for a job and we were just sharing our experiences. So, so keep an open mind. Um, there's other things that a lot of people are involved in sports with their children and you can volunteer to be um, uh, you know a part-time coach you don't have to go all the way but just to show up another funny story was my uh, husband was laughing uh, in, to the end of the earth because he saw me marching down the street in Glen Ellen in a boy scout uniform <laughs> he's like he thought I was really uh, doing a stylish number so you'll find yourself doing things that you don't necessarily uh, have done in the past, but it, it's a way of expanding your 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 network and getting to kind of pull out some different parts of your personality. And I tell you, you'll you'll laugh because at some point you'll look at yourself and say, "This this is really kind of fun. This is pulling me out of my shell and getting me out and moving around in in the community." So that's something to keep in mind. Um, in terms of some of the other things that we um, talk about, this all started with a, a woman who was a uh, school teacher, and she she started this whole thing by writing this book about this several years ago. Her name is Su Suzanne Moraine. She's older now and she's retired, but um, it's interesting that it wasn't somebody in corporate America that wrote it, but it was this teacher, and she said, you know, a lot of people are really shy; they don't really like to admit it, but they are. Um, she's equates networking on the same power as people that are um, fearful of public speaking. I mean, you can probably discern by now that neither Angela or I have a problem talking, but uh, so she wrote the book called How to Work a Room, and I, I kind of paraphrased it and said how to really work a room. And the truth is that's, that's a, a generalization because you might be in the checkout line at Jewel, you might be at uh, walking out of church on a Sunday morning. A lot of these things can take 
take uh, effect anywhere you are. And that's what we really want to encourage is, you know, wherever you are, wherever there's an opportunity to talk to some people and network out, we want to encourage you to do it. So what is the big deal? Technology, we all know technology is just huge in today's business world and in our personal lives. Four months ago, the name Zoom didn't, um, didn't conjure up, oh no, not another Zoom call, <laughs> no. <laughs> but it has actually been a lifeboat for all of us in business as well as in our personal lives uh, being, you know, sheltering in place. It's been able to keep us connected virtually, um, both odd, odd, you know, auditorily as well as visually, because it's, it's so much better than just a, a FaceTime to be able to do, you know, the, the Zoom calls with, with 20 people, 30 people, 50 people, or even, even the small groups. So it has been a, a lifeboat for all of us. Social media, mobile devices now, um, the, the average person spends six hours per day according to digital.com. Our awake time, 15 hours a day online. Um, this, is, this is huge, this is a huge chunk of our lives. And the millennials and younger are much more comfortable texting and doing things online than face to face. It's important to be able to do both. We're always going to, well, hopefully once we come into phase four and phase five of COVID, we will be once again doing business face to face, which will never go away. And of course, many people look at, you know, what is a death taxes and public speaking as the things <laughs> that they're, they're most afraid of. The Shyness Clinic at Stanford says that 80% of people are identified as shy. So all of us are in the same boat as far as being somewhat apprehensive when you are either giving presentations, you're going to a networking event. So that's important to remember. Other people are feeling the same way. You're not out there in a fishing boat on the water by yourself. You're, you're on ocean liner where everyone is feeling the same way. Something um, I always felt was, was very important through the years, and I think it still is to this day, and that is after you have an interview, be sure and send a handwritten note to the people that you interviewed with because you will stand out. In this world where people are using technology so much, people love a personal touch, and we don't want to forget and get away from that. So what can we do today? I think um, trying to come up with concrete um, action items is what we were trying to uh, achieve today. And we understand that so many things that you um, are encouraged to do in networking is what you were encouraged not to do probably growing up um, from your parents. Like don't butt in, don't, don't interrupt, don't, don't do things that are really forward. And, and unfortunately, you know, there's, there's a line between what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So we want to teach you how to, if there's a group of people, how do you kind of discreetly slide into the conversation without seeming, you know, like obnoxious or rude? I mean, there are things you can do that would make these things more seamless. Um, and the thing is, it's really as confident as I may sound right now. I was really very shy when I was younger and I thought, oh, I'm going to sound stupid. Or I worked primarily um, on magazines, trade magazines, and it was all men. And I was the only woman most of the time. And that was very difficult for me but I overcame it. Um, and I think if you start doing some of these exercises that we're uh, suggesting, I think you'll find that you'll start seeing incremental uh, improvements in your performance and your networking ability. So roadblocks is uh, Kathleen just, just mentioned, this is not what our mothers taught us. We do want to talk to strangers. It's imperative <laughs> to talk to strangers. And you don't need to wait to be introduced. Yeah, you don't want to be pushy. You want to be assertive. Assertiveness is a real positive. And how you can gauge this is watch for body language. Watch if people are listening to you, they tend to lean in. They tend to be more at ease with 
their their body language. They're not, you know, they're not antsy to get away from you. So it's always important to, to watch, watch for that. Uh, everyone, everyone has a fear of rejection. That's human nature. So we all just need to, to face it, bite the bullet and, you know, go up to people. If you're going to a presentation and they have the cocktail hour beforehand, you just need to have the, uh, the courage to go up and start, start talking with people. And we mentioned briefly in places such as dry cleaners, Walgreens, the grocery store, when you're in line, it's a good place to just practice the skill of, hey, gosh, isn't it great that we have a nice day out there today? And then see where it goes from there. You never know where a professional contact can come up. It's always important to remember that professional behavior is, is always the way to go. Um, you, it's not, it's never a good idea to start with a joke. A, a joke can be appropriate to one person, inappropriate to another. Keep it professional. For me, something that, that's across the board, people like to talk about our sports. And as, as we all know, right now we are sports deprived. I would be talking cubbies ad nauseum <laughs> if we weren't in this COVID world. But one thing um, I've been talking with people about because we are so sports store, ah, starved, excuse me, The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan and the Bulls documentary that aired on ESPN, the ratings were through the roof. And many, many people, um, it's just easy to start a conversation about the last dance. Uh, on that same area, I um, am not much of a sports nut myself, but <clears throat> I enjoy movies. And I think a lot of people, especially these days, are watching movies. Uh, the Michael Jordan thing, I think everybody except me was watching that. <laughs> but, but, you know, pick things that are kind of generic that are not going to be um, uh, anything that people would get upset about. But, you know, there's... Um, Ford Ferrari's a movie that I watched recently. It was a great movie, four hours long. Great movie. And, you know, you bring up things like this, people, like, right away will join in and give you their opinion, and you get things going on a real positive uh, uh, route. So, once again, back to um, <clears throat> what your mother told you not to do. Um, I think it's important to um, try and learn to be um, uh, a polite but but more forceful than you've probably been in the past and I think that's a that's a skill I, I never really knew how I learned to break into groups and there would usually be five or six men at a conference at a trade show and, and here I would come along and it took me a long time to figure out okay how do I break into this well sometimes I met somebody and I knew one person in the group and I mean a lot of these things you just have to kind of learn as you go um, the other thing uh, that we talk about is keep it professional. It's, there's so much going on these days and people misconstrue things easily. Um, and so I think it's important that you keep it professional and Angelo will talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, you always want to, um, in keeping it professional, you always want to be friendly, but also keep it very business-like. We will come to a, a point where handshake again is appropriate you want to keep it firm you're not going to move in too close everyone is uncomfortable with close talkers so during the COVID world and initially when we get back to some professional meetings that are face to face you can kind of use the elbow bump as a an ice breaker because it's unnatural to all of us so you know, do the elbow bump and like, you know, oh, how long is it before we're going to do the regular handshake again? <laughs> Make light of it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's um, always good to take the high road. It's not appropriate for, you know, hugging, patting on the back, uh, bus kissing on the, on the cheeks. It's just, it's just not a good idea. And then of course, as I mentioned before, jokes, it could be appropriate to one person, to another person, it could be offensive. So you just want to you know, keep it very, very professional. Just a quick story. I was a publisher and I had about 15 people working for me. My VP was very uh, cautious and I, I have a uh, just a habit of, you know, 
touching somebody on the shoulder or I, one of my sales reps came in and had a good day, I'd pat him on the back or, and I really was not even that aware of how much I, I was touching people and it was on the <laughs> arm or it wasn't anything other than just a congratulatory type um, uh, thing. But he was adamant and he, apparently he'd been through a couple lawsuits at where people had talked about, you know, things they'd been through and had, had legal battles and stuff like that. And I, it was really, it took me a long time and he, he just busted my chops every time and he uh, wanted me to know um, how important it was. So just, I mean, nobody's going to sue you. I, you're looking for a job, but just be mindful that people have certain boundaries in terms of what they're comfortable with um, in terms of having you even, you know, grab their arm or do pat them on the back. I mean, a lot of those things can be, um, can be offensive to people. So just be mindful of that. Well, everyone's are different. So it's better to just be very, very conservative where that's concerned. So the next thing we wanted to talk about is take an easy risk. Don't start at the top. Do something that's easy. So the first thing you have to do is kind of psych yourself up. If this is hard for you, you've got to think positive thoughts. And I think that's a real important part of your um, whole job hunt is, is thinking, I'm not a victim. This is happened to 22 million people. I just got to get out there and make it work for me. But at the same time, you have to think about... Um, you might have some idols or people that you like to listen to. I went to see Tony Robbins once, who's a big motivational speaker. He worked for President Clinton and various politicians. Well, I walked into the United Center and it was freezing cold on purpose because he wanted us all to stay awake. <laughs> and he kept playing Billy Idol music and it was thumping. And I was like, I was like, what's going on here? Well, I was awake. I was alert. I was really um, mindful of what, what the thing was. So Whatever it takes for you to kind of get in the, you know, if you got to take a brisk walk around the block, or if you get to an event, you want to walk around the parking lot, just kind of get your nerves out. Or if you want to put music on, I'm a big music lover. Um, do whatever you need to get comfortable and, and do things that are going to help you. Um, like we said, practice um, in easy places like at grocery stores or the dry cleaners. I mean, just start talking to people and trying to see what kind of um, relationships you can carve out in, in simple terms. And of course, just show up. Or like Nike says, just do it. We all are afraid of rejection, like, like I already mentioned, but most certainly it will be a zero success rate and you will be rejected if you don't show up. I mean, you <laughs> gotta increase those chances. Go, go, meet people. And again, consider volunteering. Uh, Kathleen mentioned the food, the food banks, which is so huge right now. I love, I love helping uh, People's Resource Center and Glen Ellen's Food Bank. It's scout activities, uh, church leaders, Art Institute, all of these things you are meeting people and, and of course you're gonna end up enriching your personal relationships as well as your professional. And what, what could be better than that? But increasing job options while attending these events, you never know when you're going to strike gold. It is just basically a numbers game. Increase the time that you're out there meeting people, and that increases the chance that you're going to meet one or many people who lead you down the path of your next job. You can gain new insights being around uh, new people. It's just, uh, again, a numbers game. I think uh, it's. Um, only natural to say uh, sometimes it's just hard to get pumped up to do this so sometimes you're really going to have to push yourself because you know we all love to lay on the couch and grab the remote and relax but you're going to really have to plan uh, when you're going to go where you're going to go um, and, and really give it some thought. Um, I think one of the things that uh, helped me was um, trying to think about things that I might be more interested in like the chamber has always been interesting to me because it's a real diverse group of people and they're there they're specifically there to to meet other people and make contact so everything's pretty much out in the open um i i'm also mindful of when i go into something it's like you know when i'm with the scouts or i volunteer with the kids groups at school you know they see me more as a, a mother and a parent and in that role you know how do i come off and then to segue into well i'm also a professional so you kind of have to think about how you're going to handle these things. And you should definitely, definitely have some kind of an elevator pitch, which is, I am Kathleen Gallagher. I'm a marketing executive, and I'm hoping to find some consulting jobs that would um, entail working at home and give a 
a vendor, low cost leads or whatever, but you got to think ahead and kind of plan what you're going to do. Otherwise you find yourself mumbling. <laughs> can, can I just uh, interrupt here for a second? Please Jim. Uh, some comments came in. Uh, Lucille asked, uh, should you send both snail mail and email or just snail mail uh, or a thank you note? Uh, an anonymous attendee said, speaking from experience as a hiring manager, uh, handwritten notes are great. However, the lag time with delivery and office routing, uh, often the decision is made before the handwritten note is received. Uh, comments from my peers also thought this was something old people still do, stuck in their old way. Well, I can say that it's good to do both, but I can speak to a lot of 30-somethings that obviously you respond via email, but the people who did send a thank you note, you know, they were late 20s and early 30s, and I've had several people say that it was mentioned to them during the process how appreciated it was. So maybe it was old people hiring them, but from my experience and what I've heard several solid responses back after a person was hired was that it was appreciated. But that does not say that you don't do the email address, the email as well. I think it really depends upon the situation. I'm, I'm for anything that's gonna distinguish you in a way that's favorable. I'm a big one to clip out articles or to put something in the mail that says, um, pertinent to our conversation, here's what I found on XYZ subject. So, what you want to do is distinguish yourself and make yourself stand out. And I, I like the handwritten note because I, I think it's, it's still distinctive, but it, it depends. I mean, if you're dealing with um, companies where you think that's not going to be appropriate, you, you really have to make a judgment call in terms of what you think is appropriate. Okay, uh, another comment, well, this has to do with COVID. Uh, when networking in person, is it bad to wear a mask? That was Sarah, and then she continues, is there a way to network with people when all uh, these kinds of events and activities are canceled? Uh, for example, uh, she used to volunteer at a hospital, which is her field, but it's been canceled uh, for the time being. Uh, she's also worried about volunteering at other places due to COVID. So it's, I, I would say, uh, one, is it to wear a mask? And two, how do you network when a lot of the events aren't there anymore? Does, oh, yeah. does, she, does she have uh, email addresses, et cetera? It kind of leads into work to plan. Like when you, you know, go to events, like she has obviously in the past worked with these people in person. Did she collect business cards? Did she put the contacts into her outlook so she knows how to reach out to people? Because if you were doing those things um, as, a, as a regular practice, before COVID, you would have a database of people that you could reach out to and still be in communication with people. It kind of leads into the next work, the plan also, because when you're working with people, you should have a resume and a file on your phone. And as you have met somebody, be able to email them five minutes later with your resume instead of having to go back to your office and do that. So I would say if she has been working with these people face to face, I would think that she should have, if she was working it, she would have a database of, of people with email addresses and all that she could still be in communication with people yeah. as the face to face has been canceled. Well, we're hopeful this is gonna last forever. And I think we're coming to the stage with the virus that, you know, people will be allowed to start to congregate in bigger groups now. And it, it's very frustrating. I can't imagine some of the challenges that some of you are having because it, it is more difficult. We've never seen anything like this, but um, I pride myself on being creative. And that's why I try to sit down and think, you know, what is it I can mail to this person or what is this I can do that would distinguish me? And what, what's really, um, I mean, I've done, I used to give out liquor and that really didn't go over well with some people. I mean, if you can think of something that's really pertinent to the job that you're applying for, um, I would follow up. Even if you haven't met them, I would start some kind of a campaign. The thing um, that you have to remember is you don't have anything to lose. If you haven't had a meeting or you haven't gotten in to see somebody, you haven't really um, got anything to lose. And it is hard now, but the church, I think the churches are opening up. I know not everybody's 
faith-based, but churches are, I think, are going to be a good place. The health clubs are starting to open up again. I'm a health club member. So, um, you know, it's really difficult, but you're going to have to look for, for places uh, that are starting to open up that might be opportunities for you. Okay. Uh, one thing I want to interject. Yes, the uh, slides will be sent out to everybody uh, with a copy of the video. Uh, probably by next week because this takes a time to process everything. Uh, Caroline says, "There, thanks for the content. Are you suggesting we talk to someone at the dry cleaner? Is that just practice? Or are you suggesting we then try talking to them about looking for a job?" Uh, followed up, oh, Caroline. It's Go ahead. practice just approaching a person a and starting conversation. No, we're not saying go to the dry cleaner, get a job, go to Walgreens, get a job, go to Mariano's, get a job. It is just continually practicing Practice. to start a conversation with a stranger because even in those instances, when that gets more comfortable, it's going to become your, when you are at a professional gathering because you're used to doing it in your personal life you're going to be comfortable doing it but no i wouldn't suggest a dry cleaner as no a but good it's place just, to get a job point is just whenever you have the opportunity to try and start a conversation or get information i mean my kids were looking for colleges for a while and i tell you i asked the postman the mailman because i went to 10 colleges and i thought i need to know you know what's going on in the college scene so I, I got a lot of information and don't prejudge people because I think you can see people in jobs that are some somewhat simplistic and think, oh, they must not have much on the ball. People are in all kinds of jobs these days with all kinds of, um, you know, capabilities. So. Okay. And uh, there was also, how do you, uh, if you don't have a network because you've been out of workplace for a while and then the opposite end is how do you safely network while you're employed? Uh, Kathleen asked that, uh, fearful about losing the job, and if they find out I'm looking for a job. So uh, I'll let you guys answer that, and I do have something about uh, someone who found a job. Uh, go ahead. Oh, good. Well, when you're looking for a job and you have a job, you need a second computer that you use in your home office to reach out for people because workplaces all the time now go in and they see people's emails. It's not, you know, yeah, it's done all the time. Sure so you need that. to keep your, your resumes and your job search on your, your personal. You don't want to have uh, anybody contacting you on your, your work this email. Nice, yeah. I mean, you can, you know, have your Gmail loaded on your phone and during work hours, you could answer somebody so it's on a timely basis. But, and then obviously you're not gonna share with coworkers, no matter who you think it is, it's, you know, it's Jean, she's my good friend. Eh, no, you don't trust anybody. Yeah, I think being discreet is important. And, you know, it's, it's a real juggling act because it's a full-time job, just having a job, and then you start trying to find a job, and it's, it's really stressful, I think, any of us that have tried to do that. But I would say be, be as discreet as possible, and as Angela said, you think you can trust Susie in accounting, and it turns out you can't. So, um, and, you know, just try and do stuff before work, if you can meet somebody for coffee or after work, meet people for coffee or whatever. I, I would always try and work it into my schedule that I... I would go and meet people when I wasn't um, pressed for time because it turned out to be a good conversation. I didn't want to have to hop up and go back because my lunch break was over. So keep a lot of those things in mind. Yeah, one of our staff, uh, her husband used to ride the train on every day and I know he was in the information technology. I can't remember exactly what, but he was talking to this one guy and you know how people have their seats on the train. Well, they were talking and somehow the conversation came up. Uh, was some, This guy asked the husband, would you consider uh, other possibilities? And then start to talk to him about positions at his company. And the husband was putting in all these hours and he says, well, yeah, what the heck, I'll check it out. And wound up uh, getting hired at the position for more money and less hours. Yeah. It's kind of bizarre, but it's more 
uh, and we forget this, it's relationship building. And when you're in the job search mode, it's, I always say it's like velociraptors uh, <laughs> circling the herd is that, and this is why I think 80% of people are, are, don't like this is because you feel you're asking for a favor, you haven't talked to these people for a while, and then all of a sudden, boom, you pop out of nowhere. Hey, I'm looking for a job, if you know of anything, and things like that. So uh, I believe that's the issue. Uh, and the other thing is uh, you can network all the time, I believe. Uh, just standing in line, uh, you know, at Jewel, like you mentioned. Uh, I think the events will start coming up. Uh, and the thing is, is just, uh, I would, uh, you know, if you're in line, even if you have a mask on, it's okay to talk to people. You know, I talk to the cashiers all the time. Uh, you don't know who knows who. You know, I've, I run a mini job club inside of uh, uh, a doctor's office when I took my son there. The, one guy was unemployed, another one was looking, uh, was searching for a job, and I was doing a little networking session right there. So you don't know uh, what goes on. Uh, let me just read uh, another question or something. And uh, even if you haven't talked to people in a while, I don't know, something just happened here. Um, See, I have many connect. Uh, this is from uh, someone. I have many connections for my previous job, but unsure how to restart the conversation. What are some examples of how to begin the conversation, or just fluidly, without any awkwardness? Well, I, I think honesty is always the best policy, and just I, I'm very direct anyway. But I would just either I, uh, kind of warm them up by sending them an email and say, "Haven't spoken to you in a while. Hope the family's doing well." Um, I could, I would appreciate if you could help me in X, Y, Z. And I think it's so common, like 20 years ago when I lost my job the first time, I mean, it was like a big deal, but now, I mean, it's so common that people get downsized, right size, fired. You know, I, I think people are more, um, receptive to getting a phone call from somebody that you haven't talked to in six months. And he says, Hey, can you help me find a job? And I, I would always reiterate, you know, if you are in a similar situation, I'd be happy to help you, or I'd be happy to help your son. Or daughter who's looking for a job so I, I mean I think you limit yourself if you don't reach out to people even if you haven't talked to them in a while I don't know Angela what do you think oh I most definitely agree and everybody needs to understand that so many people are in the same boat have been in the same boat so there's always going to be as we talked about there's going to be a level of awkwardness but most people like to help people and like kathleen said could you help me most people like to help other people and then i think jim's example of his work colleague whose spouse ended up getting a job from that type um, situation which was totally unplanned it speaks out to you always want to be just practicing talking to people there was an example where they weren't at a work event they weren't at um, a job fair, but yet that's what it turned into. So it can be anywhere that it happens. I would like to mention that I know of two managers who got hired uh, because of their direct reports who went to other companies uh, when they all got laid off. So I would encourage you is if you had good relationship with your staff, either higher or lower, is to initiate the conversation again, and also use LinkedIn to find people. Uh, Mary asked, where can I find information on groups that are designed for networking? Uh, we used to publish a list right now. There's a lot of flux on where they are. Uh, we, we publish some of the things that we're uh, presenting at. Uh, I know Path Group at Compass Church does uh, put out what the local job clubs are doing. Uh, and a lot of the job clubs are reforming right now or merging, uh, depending on the situation. Uh, LinkedIn is, a, is another question, but 
Um, wow, got a lot of questions here. Uh, I tell you what, maybe you'll address these. I, I'm just going to read them, and then you can uh, you, you can write them down. Uh, so with COVID out there, do you wear a mask in the interview is one thing. Uh, tips on networking using LinkedIn. Uh, thoughts on business cards. Uh, how do you get that deep with strangers in a checkout line or a train station about your profession and what you're looking? Uh, and then uh, someone mentioned about uh, virtual Toastmaster meetings. Mm -hmm. And then uh, how do you network in a COVID environment virtually? So if you can address those and we'll just move on with the presentation. How's that? I think I, I love LinkedIn. I, I haven't used it as much as I should, but my son is uh, 26 and he's, he's on LinkedIn all the time and has really good luck. I'll ask him, I said, well, how did you find that person? Well, I got him off of LinkedIn and, and he's a good cold caller. He gets on the phone. But the thing that I just learned about LinkedIn, I'm pretty sure it was just recently, they would show different things. And I got my master's degree at uh, Lewis University. So there's different ways you can go in and find out, oh, so-and-so, uh, you, you find a link. Like the thing you have in common is this person went to the same graduate school or undergraduate school. And those things, I think people are always, alumni are always willing to help people. I think that's been my experience. So I guess I, I can't say enough about LinkedIn. I, I would encourage you if you can afford it to uh, upgrade and buy their, their top plan. Because I, I still get stuff all the time. People looking to hire me and I'm like, wow, where was this five years yeah, ago? I agree. Yeah. Um, it's a very, very good tool. Somebody mentioned Toastmasters. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I did Toastmasters on and off for a couple of years. And there's uh, a group I know in Glen Ellen that I was part of. And, you know, it really gives you a good sense of belonging because they're very, they're very tight groups, nice people. And they're, they're very um, non-judgmental. I mean, I talk too much. I say, ooh, and I'm too much. And they were, they were so kind trying to help me with my speech uh, uh, challenges. So I would do that. And you know what? We just have to think, you know, some of this stuff is going to wind down. It might be two or three weeks before you can get more people in church. It's going to be time. But we have to think shaking hands is going to come back. Some of these things will come back sooner than, than others. We just have to be patient. What were some of the other ones, Jim? I'm trying to think LinkedIn, the... And LinkedIn, it's, it's good to even work with a professional on, you know, some of the, uh, the content, especially the lead-in content. I would, I would suggest that. So yeah, besides LinkedIn, Toastmasters, what, what were some of the other groups of questions there? I think one thing before I forget, I wanted to bring up, I, um, I, I always try and do too much and then I get frustrated because I've only done five of the 15 things I wanted to do in a day. But I think one thing that I've started to do when I was looking for jobs was um, get an accountability thing going. So you'd have one partner and you, or, or sometimes I was in a group with four people and you meet every other Tuesday. And if you have somebody you have to be accountable to, I think that changes the whole dynamic because, um, you know, I'm a procrastinator and I think, oh, I'm supposed to do this. But when I got into this accountability group, I was in with three guys that were my neighbors. We had a great time. It made me always make my calls and send out my um, follow-up letters because I knew I was going to have to meet on Tuesday morning at nine o'clock at, you know, Donata Square and talk about what I'd done. So if you don't have an accountability partner or a buddy, I definitely would um, encourage you to do that. It's, you know, it's really a, an effective plan. Yeah, that leads into the, uh, the buddy system, going back to the pr presentation, where you can be going to a professional event. It's always good to get there a little bit early. And when you are paired with somebody, you can ease into a group of people having a discussion, double your chances of great networking, but then you can single off. You can compare notes as to the contacts that, that were made. Um, in those situations, too, there's been times where I've had a group picture taken of people. Hey, let's get a group picture taken. People have their name tags on. 
that will also help you connect the name, the company with a face. And then of course you're getting the business card. So it's just one more way to not only have a business card, but to connect a face with a company with who you met. Well, that's a good thing to follow up on. I'm not much, I have a nice phone and all the equipment, but I know people that I work with really make a point out of taking pictures at different events. And that gives you something to follow up on. You can send a, you know, send a copy of it over to somebody or say, hey, I took a great picture. Would you like to see it? So sometimes you have to make things up to talk about in terms of how you reach out to, to new people. And to continue that conversation that you had. But just real quick on the buddy system, what I recommend is go to an event um, with somebody and you have a strategy in mind. But the thing is, you got to un unhitch yourself because you get there, you're both kind of jazzed about being in a, a new environment. But take like 45 minutes and each one of you take a different part of the room or take a different convention hall or take a different path. And then just figure, okay, let's take 45 minutes and we'll meet back here at, uh, at lunchtime. And that way you're there with somebody, so it kind of gives you some support, but you're really on your own and you're creating your own, um, your own sales leads. The next thing we wanted to talk about were great opening lines. And I think this is real important because I've said some of the most inane things in my career, only out of naive, naivete. I just didn't always know what to say. But um, there's things that I think are so simple, and that's what's the space that wrote the, the book um, about smiling. I was talking about the other day. Um, Carnegie, Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie. My mother wanted me to read Dale Carnegie, and I'm out of this book is dated and finally about five years ago I read it and his whole chapter talks about smiling and I'm like oh that's really off the wall that but that it, book is, is it's, timeless it's, it's like Stephen Covey's yeah uh, effective habits yeah yeah but I, I couldn't believe it I was downtown and I'd start smiling at people and people smile back and I thought there's simple ways to start breaking the ice and, and getting yourself going but what we want to talk about now is great opening lines what you want to do if you're talking to somebody new is do not ask them a yes or no question because they'll ine inevitably say, yes, I'm a friend of the bride or no, I'm not a friend of the bride. Um, if I'm at an event, I always say, wow, that I, I used to go to things that may be here and it's beautiful and they'd have like a thousand people for dinner and there'd be a bunch of people standing by themselves by the door or somewhere. And I'd go up to somebody and say, isn't this the most stunning view you've seen? Have you been here before in the springtime or whatever? Um, and ask something that's, you know, kind of upbeat or you want to be um, upbeat all the time. Uh, you can say, tell me about your business. You'll probably be there for two hours. The thing that's fail safe is um, I have two grown children, but if you start talking to people, either grandchildren or children, if you ask them about their kids, I mean, you'll have a friend for life because they'll probably start talking about Johnny's grade at football or whatever. So there are things you can do that... Um, that are simple. You can talk about the speaker, what your thoughts were about the speaker. But think about, before you're going there, think about, okay, what can I say that's going to engage me with somebody that's, that's kind of clever, kind of interesting? Yeah, no, reiterating, you can be someone's savior in a face-to-face -face situation like that. Because as we mentioned, 80% of people are shy. Everyone has a fear of rejection. So just always remember Nearly everyone is uncomfortable. So you can go up to someone that looks particularly uncomfortable and be their savior and, you know, start a conversation. I'll probably grab it, but I'm so glad that somebody came to talk to them. <laughs> it kind of feeds into as well, like some of these. Um, Maybe join me in a conversation. Sure. Yeah. This is what Angela and I talked about in terms of how you kind of jump into this group of four or five people. And there might be one person in this group you really want to talk to. And um, it might be five or six people. But uh, well, Angela was saying, I, I said, you can be really formal and go in and just shake somebody's hand and say, excuse me, I just wanted to say hi to John Smith and shake your hand when we get back to shaking hands. Or as Angela advocated, just kind of start sliding. Do the to, slide in. Right? Yeah, she's like, just kind of start moving yourself in there and paying attention and trying to um, see if you can integrate yourself into the group. So um, that, and, and like we said about Dale Carnegie, be, be pleasant and smile. I mean, I think if you're friendly and you look welcoming, people will respond the same way. The other thing um, that we wanted to talk about is, is over talking with one person because you're nervous. And Angela's gonna talk about how that can be a pitfall too if you get a little too anxious and you stay with one person too long. 
Yeah, it's always good um, to, to move, move on. You need to watch the body language as we talk about, and then um, be advised at these professional events. There's always um, usually a host company with host company representatives. You want to, before you make your exit, you want to thank those people for hosting the events. You want to make sure that they have your business card. Talking about a consumption assumption. I can remember a, an awards trip in New Orleans and there was a, uh, a colleague who usually did not drink hard alcohol, who enjoyed the uh, hurricanes at O'Brien's. <laughs> Well, that, that colleague wasn't able to make the awards dinner and the awards presentation, which is really the whole reason to be there. So case in point, remember at these professional events, this is not a, a woo-hoo time. This is a time where you're meeting people, you're being professional, and loose lips sink ships. Um, Angela and I had a conversation about New Orleans because there's a lot of conventions and things that go down there. My, my New Orleans story was great party. My whole staff was there. All of our key advertisers were there. And this one woman, very attractive, middle-aged, blonde, apparently had never been to New Orleans, but she caught on pretty quick. Well, I, I kept telling my sales rep, I said, you kind of get her under control. And he said, Kathleen, I can't even start to think about it. But one of the things in New Orleans, and I can be uh, diplomatic when I say this, is to uh, kind of... Um, flash people, like pull your shirt up and do different things, which was so inappropriate. And I tell you, people talked about this woman for three days and she was so drunk. I mean, it was I'm embarrassing. I'm sure it was years. It was embarrassing. I mean, they it was embarrassing about it. for me as a hostess. It was my party. We spent thousands of dollars to have this gathering at one of the swankier places in New Orleans. So even if, you know, you're going to get falling down drunk, but, you know, I go to these things. I drink Diet Coke or ginger beer or something, just focus on what's important because people will be remembering how you came across and, and the things that you said. So be very mindful of that. And then there's obviously things that you don't talk about whether we're, whether we're talking about the virtual world or when we're back into the, the real world. Um, two of those are politics and religion. Those are not a they don't bode well normally because people have very, very strong opinions in both of those cases. So again, we're just talking about things that everybody can enjoy talking about, whether it's sports, movies, books. Will the Cubs get to play to no fans so we can at least watch on TV this year? Traffic, comments from the crowds, etc. So again, it leads into professional behavior is, is always what you want to exhibit. Yeah, I think um, it, things are so open and so um, well open these days and it's hard to um, be mindful of what you're, what you're saying because I, I mean, people have conversations about everything and a lot of people have much broader um, experiences that they want to talk about, but I would always err on the side of being conservative. If you think Absolutely. something might be inappropriate, whether it's about sex or drugs or movies or whatever, definitely not politics. Uh, even medical, I mean, I'm older now and I, I get in these groups and these people start talking about their medical ailments. I'm like, I don't care that you're on naproxen. I don't want to know about your knees. Uh, it's really, I mean, it's really kind of inappropriate and stuff that I, I really have no, even if I might care about them, I, I still think it's inappropriate. So. Um, think about what you're going to talk about and, and as you're going over there, think, okay, we could talk about the Michael Jordan thing. That's kind of cool. Or I just saw this movie. That's kind of neat. Or um, what are we going to do for the 4th of July since there's no fireworks has come up with a new plan. So you have to really give some thought as to what you're going to talk about. Take a breath and breathe. Again, everybody. Am I on the right slide here? I just want to make sure. I'm... No, um, actually where you want to be, Jim, is breathe. Which we're, we're towards the end. We're kind of trying to. We're we're up. toward the end. I'm sorry. I, no, it's okay. Yeah, we're just we're just moving on. So. I was just looking for. Uh, okay, well, where are we at here? Okay. I'm sorry. 
That's all right. That's, no, that's all right. I, 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 we're, just keep going and it's, it's uh, breathe. Yeah, we're just mindful. I think we're, we want to cover as much as we can. I thought we were kind of running maybe a little shy in the time. So. Yeah, because it's, it's two minutes after 10 right, right now. So. Well, we are going to send out a copy of the slides. Right. So you all have them. Uh, I was just trying to make sure all the answers were getting covered uh, or the questions were getting covered. And uh, here we are. Okay, there just let me know when you want me to advance. Will do. Will do. So, breathe. As, as we've talked about, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has uncomfortable feelings about advancing into these conversations. And one thing that Kathleen and I want to just mention is there's going to be times where you think, oh my gosh, well, this was just terrible. I, I remember a time where I had a presentation to a whole region, <laughs> you know, over 200 people. And the presentation was, was fantastic. I left very early in the morning, however. And after the presentation, people came up, they had questions, all that went really well. Well, then it did, uh, <laughs> it, it was noticed that I had two different pairs of shoes on. I had two different colors of uh, shoes, one black, one blue. Was the same style, so wasn't noticeable when I was walking, et cetera, so I didn't notice it. But at the time, I was totally embarrassed, but then it ended up being, like I said, the presentation went really well, the questions went well, and what I thought was so horrible at the time ended up somebody took a picture of <laughs> my feet in the two different shoes and they even had it framed for me. And it, as well as the presentation being a success, it brought an element of humor and it ended up kind of being a good thing. Would I ever plan to do that? Absolutely not. But sometimes you think the worst thing that could happen that happened, not so much. It wasn't, wasn't that bad. A lot of people got a big kick out of it. My embarrassing story, we were talking about this. I was in, and I remember to the day, the guy's name was Bob Burns. He was at a flavor company in Indianapolis. And um, mm -hmm. I was making a presentation and his secretary came in and said, uh, Mr. Burns, we're just you know, ready to wrap up. And then he, she came back in 10 minutes and said, hey, Mr. Burns, it's time to wrap up. Well, the reason we weren't wrapping up is I popped the button on my skirt. And every time I would go to stand up, my skirt was falling down. So <laughs> this went on for about 20 minutes until the secretary finally came in for the third time. And I just had to own up. I said, you know, I'm really sorry. I, this is what happened and I, I, I'm afraid to get up. So they were, they were very kind. They went and got me a big safety pin. But, you know, sometimes weird things happen and you just got to kind of punt. The other thing, the other story that I share, which I think has significance is um, my uh, husband and I used to go to parties in Barrington for his, um, his company. He was a banker and an MBA and very... Um, bright guy, but his social skills by his own admission were, were lacking. So every time we go to one of these big parties, we would be there for an hour and he'd say, okay, Kate, let's, let's go. And I go, no, we have to go say goodbye. No, we don't. No, we don't. So we get into these big harangues about whether or not we were going to go talk to the host and hostess. And I finally convinced him. But if somebody has an event, they're probably in charge. So, you know, make sure you introduce yourself, whether they're, um, like association executives or um, people that are higher up in the social strata or the business strata. And I mean, I know it's uncomfortable sometimes, but it's, it's so worth it to go up to your host and say, I really had a wonderful time. Thank you for inviting me and, and just be, be gracious and you make an impact because most of the time people have spent so much time, energy and money putting together a meeting or a party or a lunch that there, it's great to hear that somebody really enjoyed it. So so don't sneak out the back door. I used to call my, my husband um, Al the Dodger. I love that. Yeah, because he was uh, dodging out the back door. Well, he's an accountant. That, that wasn't his sweet spot. He was really kind of shy. So, I mean, take advantage of those things uh, and, and make sure you express your gratitude for the invitation. So and now we do have a, a couple minutes, although we are well after 10 o'clock, for a couple more questions. Otherwise, we do provide email addresses for either one of us, but Jim, you probably have a couple of things to dovetail onto the end of this as well. Well, I'm keeping your uh, uh, things up here. So one is that uh, as far as networking, people were asking, uh, and I'll get to some of the questions on here. 
how do you do it, you know, and do a deep dive or something. So I was up in uh, Lake Geneva picking up something for my wife. She had a cape made uh, for her mom. So I'm in this yarn shop and the ladies, you know, I'm picking up the cape and I said, oh, wow, a lot of colors and stuff. And then she's showing me around the shop and, uh, of all the different yarns and how con she's talking to me about this. So I said, oh, I understand the fine detail. I'm an artist myself as my hobby. And I start showing her uh, some of my pictures that were on my phone, kind of like your resume. And then she says, do you have a card with you? And I was like, you know, and, and luckily I had... <laughs> two business cards of my hobby with me. Uh, so it was just showing interest. And uh, I always say, uh, if you're shy and introverted like me, is ask questions and be interested about what the other people are. And then eventually uh, it can, you, you can work some of your stuff in a, a, as well. Uh, let's see. I've been reaching out based on archives. Uh, oh, the, Lucille starts out with, uh, I've, she always starts out on LinkedIn, uh, I'm assuming, uh, with an article. Uh, I always start out with, uh, I like what you wrote on LinkedIn, or I saw you published X in the Wall Street Journal and thought that was really good. Uh, can we discuss? And I think that's a, an excellent way of doing that. Uh, let's see, is there anything else in here? Uh, how about uh, handbills is used in uh, some job clubs. Can they be used virtually or other marketing documents? What would you say? Well, yes, because you can take a, a handbill. I mean, um, my handbill was emailed to you, Jim. They can be sent across um, via email, obviously, or if you're, in a starting conversation via Zoom or Facebook Live, that can be like screen shared, although I would suggest getting it to the person first. But yeah, those can be used in this day and age, which of course we are all rolling with the COVID. It changes every yeah, week every as far day. as like what you can do. So we're, we're all in the same boat there. I think that's the biggest challenge other than just trying to manage how to network is like, there used to be so many different options and now with the virus, I mean, you're going to have to work uh, harder to figure out what are the best places and ways for you to get out and do stuff. Uh, can you go over, uh, cause Mark asked, how can, uh, can you explain how to use value proposition in networking situation so people can remember who you are? Well, I, I guess that's your marketing spiel. So you, you know, I know yeah, what value, value proposition. proposition. What, 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 yeah, what exactly does he mean by a value like he's proposition? He's a value proposition because he's got an MBA or something, or what's what's the? Well, I, I think what he means here is, okay, uh, what do you bring to the table? You know, I do this to okay. help companies do that, or I enjoy okay. doing this. So I guess how would you work that in so that people remember? Uh, some accomplishment or why should they remember you and refer you to someone else? What's the value that you bring to an organization? Oh, okay. Well, if there's a connectivity with someone that you're speaking with and you see a skill that you have or a skill set that you have that is a match with the person that you're talking to, because that's not always going to happen. You need to be selective. The people who are hiring, the companies are going to be selective. You as the person looking for the job also needs to be selective because if your skill set isn't at all a match, then quite frankly, don't waste your time. So one of the things would be going back to what I mentioned, if you see that there is a match in your value added, your skill set with someone that you're talking about, make sure that you have their, their business card and then you could even do it from the ladies or men's room, the lobby, you can say, really enjoyed just meeting you. It seems that you need somebody with X right, skill. Right. Send across to that person. You can email across your resume right there. Say, we were just talking. We 
we're having a glass of cab. We both like Cabernet and <laughs> you need somebody who has been in IT and worked specifically with this. And here I am. There's an example. Yeah, I think uh, you have to do some research and find out what the needs are of the company. And then it's pretty simple. You just, you know, dig around, find what three of their problem areas are, and then you figure out a way that you can articulate how you can solve those problems. But you have to do homework a lot of time and, and find out what the company's lacking so you can present yourself as a solution. I, I think that's a great way to go because as a hiring manager, that's what I would look at. I would look at how can they hit the ground running and save me time and money and start doing, you know, putting the figures on the books or whatever I needed them to do. And, and that would be um, particularly effective if you were having a one-on-one -on -one with somebody where you felt like, yeah, this, this could work. I mean, it wouldn't be an example of what to do if you're there in a group with 10 people because then the person that you're reaching out to would be like, I don't, I have no idea which person that is. So a one-on-one -on -one that it showed a match, my skill set with what this person was, was needing to hire for their company. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions here. Uh, for those of you uh, who are working with counselors here, uh, the code for today that you would email to your uh, counselor with WorkNet DuPage is NET302 uh, or November Echo Tango for your military 302 veterans. Uh, and what you do is you just email that to your counselor to show that you attended today. Uh, part of uh, the grant is that you maintain contact with your counselors uh, every month, and that's why we're offering these. Uh, virtual workshops is so that you can uh, fulfill those requirements with your counselors. Uh, so a couple things. Uh, we turned off the chat today uh, because uh, we've had a lot of bizarre stuff coming in on chat. And so I thought maybe if we went, just had question and answers, that question and answers would be okay, um, but obviously not. So I'm learning, uh, we're all learning as we go along, every job club I'm presenting at now, uh, we're learning uh, how to use Zoom more effectively. So uh, just bear with us, this is all new, you know, as was uh, I think Angela or Kath Kathleen said a couple of months ago, no one knew what Zoom is, and each time I, use Zoom, I'm finding something new, something different, plus they update and change things around. Okay, in so, answer to somebody who said that Angela was rustling and moving around, we were told that we weren't going to be on video during the presentation. Uh, One sorry. thing I was rustling and moving around was the battery on my computer was about to go dead. So the whole presentation would have gone dead if I wouldn't have rustled around and plugged in. Yes. Yeah, see, I apologize to everyone. I was going to <laughs> take them off the screen. Um, okay. Uh, let's see what's coming up. November, uh, June 19th, next Friday, Tim Murphy, he's a recruiter with SearchPath. We'll be talking about preparing for the economic storm's aftermath. Uh, following that, June 26th, I will be doing Knowledge Nomads and the Nervously Employed. Uh, it's a book. Uh, and I actually uh, was at a career conference, National Career Development Association, and went up to the speaker and told him how I used his book for a Halloween presentation uh, talking about this. And I think it's a very appropriate uh, thing today with the layoffs, with COVID, is uh, the nervously employed are looking for security. The knowledge nomads are like, oh, okay, uh, where can I take my skill set? Uh, July 3rd will be no job club because of the 4th of July holiday. And again, worknetdupage.org is uh, the website. If you are new, please go in there, uh, fill out the questionnaire, and staff will contact you. You know, And, and uh, all of the uh, job clubs uh, for the past two months are accessible to the public there, so you can view them on your own. Uh, 
Let's see if there's anything else. And I think that's going to be about it. Uh, so does anyone have any more questions? And uh, I think that's about it. Okay. So with that, I'm going to uh, end the presentation. And uh, Kathleen and Angela, if you'll hang on, we'll talk, okay? Thank you.